uh, Mina Aganajik, uh, which will give uh, us the third and last lecture about not cat categorification from mirror symmetry. Okay, um, well, thank you for joining uh, for this last lecture. So um, in this lecture, I'll explain what equivariant homological mirror symmetry is, the way I define it. So uh, mirror symmetry, remember we had this pair of mirror symmetries, one upstairs, one downstairs. Um, these uh, pair of mirror symmetries um, helps us understand exactly which questions we need to ask to recover homological not invariance from our manifold Y downstairs. Remember last time we explained how to do it from the big X upstairs. Um, and so we call the upstairs spaces, the big X and the big Y and the downstairs spaces, the small X and the small Y. So in the last lecture, I explained how homological not invariance arise from the big X. Now I'd like to explain how they come out from the small Y. That's what uh, one of the things that's gonna happen in this lecture. Now, because the small Y is an ordinary mirror of the small X, we should start by understanding how to recover homological invariance uh, from the small x instead of the big x. More generally, we'd like to understand what's the relation between categories of brains um, associated just to the upstairs spaces versus the downstairs spaces. Now, um, every B type brain on the big x that's relevant for the story comes from a B type brain downstairs on the small x via um, a, what's called a push forward functor that simply it interprets a sheaf um, or a brain downstairs on the small X as a brain upstairs on the big X. Because we're working equivariantly with respect to this large um, torus, uh, the, the, the action of um, where the core is the locus preserved by this uh, T star action um, that scales the holomorphic symplectic form. In fact, all the brains, um, the you can generate the entire derived category of the brains upstairs from these from the brains that come downstairs. That's um, one of the reasons why this, this will be so powerful. Anyway, this factor, this factor has an adjoint that goes the other way, which uh, takes a, a sheaf upstairs in the big X to a sheaf downstairs by tensoring with a structure sheaf of the core and restricting. These functors are well known, uh, their construction is standard. Moreover, another thing that's standard is that the factor, these functors are what's called adjoint. And um, that will allow us to relate computations of homes upstairs between the brains upstairs to those downstairs, a priori, um, uh, because the spaces are different, um, the derived categories are not equivalent. So given then any pair of uh, brains upstairs that come from the brains downstairs, the homes between them computed upstairs in the big X agree with the homes of the brains they came from downstairs on the small X, provided you replace this brain F with the brain obtained by taking it through a loop. You, take it, you start with the brain downstairs, send it up and push it back down. Okay, that's where the adjunct functors come in. And this functor uh, that taking the brain up and sending it back down is not identity. It's non-trivial and we'll need to understand it. But mirror symmetry implies that for every pair of objects upstairs on the big X that come from objects downstairs on the small X, there's a pair of uh, Lagrangians. I apologize, give me just a second. <laughs> Sorry, uh, there's a doorbell. <laughs> Our life on Zoom. Uh, anyway, so mirror symmetry implies that for every pair of objects um, on the big X that come from brains downstairs, there's a pair of Lagrangians um, on Y, which are mirror to the brains on the small X, such that the homes between them on the small Y agree with the homes upstairs on the big X. Um, now, the functors that enter, uh, if we think of them as just running vertically, they relate objects on the small y um, with the big y in the way that mirrors what happens on the b side. The functor that goes up is simple. Uh, in, it uh, simply amounts to pairing a brain downstairs with a, um, uh, with a torus fiber over it, which is in particular how you get pictures like this. 
in fact, both this functor and its adjoint come from um, a Lagrangian on a product of the small y with the big. Uh, this Lagrangian looks like um, a diagonal in the product of y with its uh, partner in the big y times a circle fiber over, torus fiber over it. Uh, so uh, from such a Lagrangian on the product, you can construct Lagrangian correspondence that provides these func functors. So for example, the functor that goes down corresponds to starting with a Lagrangian upstairs, intersecting it with this um, Lagrangian that provides the correspondence and projecting to the small y. We could have done the same going the other way with obvious uh, substitutions. The parallel understanding of mirror symmetries upstairs and downstairs and construction of these, of these functors, which are um, somewhat novel on the A side, is joint work with uh, Vivek Shand and Michael McBreen. Now, mirror symmetry and these functors let us trade any question in their upper left corner on the big X to a question downstairs on the lower, on the small Y. And equivariant homological mirror symmetry is a correspondence of objects and morphisms uh, between um, the derived category of coherent sheaths upstairs on the big X and the derived for chiocidal category, the category of Abrians downstairs on the small y, which one gets on the diagonal as a result. Um, in fact, it comes from its own pair of adjoint functors, which lets us forget essentially everything else. So uh, composing um, the functor that just goes straight up with mirror symmetry, we get a functor that runs along the diagonal. It's an exact functor, which means that it, um, um, it takes cones, it preserves the triangles of the derived category, which um, per definition sends any objects downstairs on small y to a brain upstairs, which is just um, the image of, um, uh, of, of, of the obvious brain on the x under um, uh, the f star functor. Okay. So we're just summarizing. Uh, similarly, you get an analogous functor that goes along the diagonal, um, which is exact as well. And by uh, homological mirror symmetry um, downstairs, uh, and existence of the adjoint functors f and f star, you can rephrase uh, uh, for any pair of brains downstairs, we get a pair of brains upstairs such that the homes coincide. This is nice, but it sounds extremely abstract. Um, in fact, it can be made very explicit. Um, so let's start by um, a running example of the big X, which is a resolution of the A minus one surface singularity. So the big X is a moduli space, uh, you recall, of a single smooth SO3 monopole in presence of M singular ones. So it turns out, and this is an old story, that um, the category of B type brains on the A minus one surface singularity is equivalent to a, a derived categories of modules of a graded algebra, ordinary associative algebra. This comes about uh, because a um, category of uh, B-type brains on the big X, which is the A minus one surface singularity, is generated by a finite collection of line bundles, which form what's called the tilting set. It means that the homes between them are non-zero only in cohomological degree zero. Uh, the algebra A, uh, whose category of modules is equivalent to the category of coherent sheaves, is simply the endomorphism algebra of the tilting vector bundle, which is you get as a direct sum of the generators. It's graded just by covariant degrees because all the homes in, non, in, in any non-trivial cohomological degree vanish. The equivalence of the two derived categories is, as I said, is an old story. It's an old story um, in, uh, due to works of Bondal and Cox. Um, um, and, um, and it comes from a Uneda type functor that maps any brain, any coherent sheaf uh, or complex of coherent sheaves to a module uh, for the algebra A. Uh, in fact, the algebra A and the corresponding, uh, the corresponds uh, to the, this surface singularity is very familiar. It's just a path under algebra of the familiar affine quiver with very familiar relations that say that uh, the arrows uh, commute going, starting from here, going this way or this way is the same. And they all have, every arrow ha carries a known T equivariant degree. What this in particular means is that the 
brain, which is a line bundle in the tilting set, maps to uh, what's called the projective module of the algebra, which has a simpler interpretation in terms of quivers. The module um, simply corresponds to um, all paths on the quiver that start on the corresponding node. Okay. There's a, also a story, well, the modules of this algebra A have a very simple to construct map to just um, uh, paths on the quiver. Essentially, that's what they are for construction. Okay. Um, so uh, the, in fact, the, the elements of the algebra are nothing but the paths on the quiver that uh, start on the, uh, the that's, that start as, as a, the home as I've written, it corresponds to paths that start on the jth node and on the ith node and have a corresponding equivariant degree. So these abstract sounding things become very concrete. Um, similarly, uh, the structure shift of say i vanishing P1 in the A minus one surface simply corresponds to sim simple module of the algebra. The one, uh, the module whose rank one for i node and zero for all the others. Um, in fact, the derived category of the core is also freely generated by uh, a collection of line bundles, which are also tilting. Um, the line bundles are uh, obtained from um, the tilting set of line bundles by, by, by this functor that goes down, tensoring with a structure shift and restriction. So it means that the category of B brains downstairs also has a description as the derived category of modules of some algebra. Um, and uh, the, the algebra, which is then the more open, the morphism algebra of the corresponding tilting vector bundle. And that algebra also has a description in terms of paths on a quiver, path algebra of a quiver. Uh, it's the same quiver as before with the same torus action. The only thing that has changed is the relation. Now, uh, a, a product of the A arrow with the B arrow is zero, going any which way. Um, so why does this happen? Well, it happens because if we describe the big X as a hypersurface, uh, the products of arrows on the quiver associated with the big X simply correspond to multiplication by Z. Each of them corresponds to multiplication by Z, which is why this relation holds. Bondal and Cox constructed this map essentially like this, understanding that arrows have um, a direct geometric interpretation. Um, and the core, the locus preserved by the T star action that scales the homomorphic symplectic form is simply the locus Z is equal to zero, which is, um, so by restriction, we get the defining relation of the algebra A. Okay. And similarly, uh, so the projective modules of this algebra A, as I said before, they map to the line bundles, they generate the, uh, in, the, in the tilting set for the, for, the, for, for, for the small x. And similarly to what happened upstairs, um, the structure sheaves of the vanishing cycles again map to simple modules of the downstairs algebra. They correct on this correspondence. Uh, now, in fact, this algebra A, uh, whose um, uh, uh, derived category is uh, of modules is the derived category of coherent sheaves on the small x, is in fact the same as the left symbol algebra we saw yesterday, um, associated to the uh, to the ordinary mirror of the small x and equivariant mirror of the a minus one surface. Uh, so we get from this, so uh, we get from this an identification between the line bundles in the tilting set of generators with a set of left symbols, the, the, the brains that run along the cylinder uh, because they're both um, projective modules of the same algebra. And again, this in very much has the flavors of mirror symmetry just for, for an infinite cylinder, right? And uh, there's a good reason why this is the case because Coulomb branches or, um, so the big X is a Coulomb branch. Coulomb branches are essentially, um, at least classically, right? Uh, they are uh, cotangent, products of cotangent bundles to a cylinder. And restriction to X is restriction to products of cylinders after quantum correction. Anyway, so um, in this way, um, homological immunosymmetry symmetry that, there are, that uh, relates X and Y downstairs, a small, small X and small Y becomes manifest. And in fact, this is how mirror symmetry should be understood generally as a manifest equivalence. Now, 
you'll recall that yesterday, so this was a very, our, our simple running toy example, but yesterday we found a general algebra that corresponds to um, general, uh, general Y associated with arbitrary simply list Lie algebra. Um, so the derived Fokai saddle category of the corresponding of, of, um, of the Y, which was dual to this big X, the monopole moduli space. Um, so the, that derived Fokai saddle category had, as I explained last time, an explicit algebraic description. The algebra is the endomorphism algebra of the left symbols in a specific chamber of parameter space. Um, you can all, again, think of it as a path algebra of the quiver, except the quivers get really complicated. So it's actually better to summarize it as um, algebra whose elements are described in terms of configurations of strings on a cylinder. Uh, it's, it's much faster and more intuitive to say what the algebra and its relations are, as I explained yesterday. Um, so this is an algebra um, uh, whose elements are, are blue strings labeled by uh, simple positive roots of the Lie algebra, um, where um, uh, which uh, and who's, who's, where the degrees of the of the quivariant degrees have to do with how the blue strings intersect each other or how they intersect the fixed red strands, the red strands that um, will eventually give rise to to knots and um, and uh, associated with punctures on this Riemann surface that perform a block uh, that associated to vertex operators. Uh, so the downstairs. The small y has an algebraic description as the derived category of modules of this algebra. Um, the, um, the category of beta brains upstairs also has an algebraic description. Uh, so the works of Cox and Bondal worked for things like toric varieties, and um, they were generalized to arbitrary homomorphic symplectic x in works of Bezrukovnikov and Kaladin uh, using uh, quantization and characteristic p. Um, the algebra uh, big a, or the, 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 uh, the algebra up the upstairs a algebra um, is uh, again the so what they what Bezrukovnikov and uh, Karladin showed is that the big X has a tilting vector bundle um, and correspondingly once you have that tilting vector bundle what that means is that the derived category of coherent sheaves is the derived category of modules of its endomorphisms. Um, now, by work of, Benz, uh, of Webster, uh, this algebra should be uh, the cylindrical version of the KRLW algebra of Kovanov, Lauda, Rokwe, and himself. It's given in similar way, by similar terms as the as this downstairs algebra A, but it has more generators. In particular, the blue strands are now allowed to carry dots. Okay. Um, and it's, it's um, restriction to A in particular, a restriction of um, to, to living downstairs corresponds to setting these dots to zero. Um, so using the algebraic description of categories upstairs and downstairs, we can say exactly what equivariant homological mirror symmetry says. Um, composing, um, so the functor that goes diagonally down is an exact functor, which what it does, it sends a component of the tilting vector bundle upstairs to left symbols. The fact that um, the derived category of brains upstairs is, um, is generated by the, um, by the vector bundles in the tilting set means that any object upstairs has a description as a complex, all of whose terms are direct sums of um, the bundles in the tilting set. It has what's called a projective resolution. <clears throat> um, this functor um, per exactness, uh, the functor that goes, that, that sends us to y per exactness takes the complex um, that gives a, this projective resolution to the complex that looks exactly the same downstairs. Usually um, derived, um, derived um, Functors don't, so it, arbitrary functors don't do this, but this one does it, okay? It just sends the complex upstairs to exactly the same looking complex downstairs, uh, where given in terms of the corresponding symbols. So you can name all the terms, knowing the complex upstairs. The functors that goes up uh, sends uh, the right symbols, which are the simple modules of the algebra A, 
into simple modules of the upstairs algebra. Moreover, um, recall that um, Ry had actually two different descriptions, algebraic description. There was a, a second description uh, that was given not in terms of uh, the left thimbles, which are these T brains, but in terms of the I brains. So any brain downstairs can be um, given a, a description as a complex, um, has a resolution as a complex of I brains. Okay? And this factor that goes up preserves that in the same way um, what, what, what happened going down in terms of uh, the resolution in terms of the right, the left symbols. Okay. So this way we can say exactly what these functors do, which way do they send brains? Okay. And moreover, they are joined, so they preserve the homes in that specific way, when you apply them in that specific way. So we know exactly for all, for all the algebras, exactly what these functors do. Um, now, the, that, uh, this, um, it turns out, a fortunate fact is that the brains that serve as caps and a caps uh, in construction of linking variants are a subset of the brains, which are the simples of the upstairs algebra and which come as images of the downstairs symbols of the brains associated with, uh, with, um, associated with the right symbols. They are the images of the right symbols on, on the dysfunction. So this has a si simple but striking consequence, which gives a, a very simple description of what homological link invariants actually are. <clears throat> so equivariant mirror symmetry is, so we, we, we know that uh, for how to recover homological knot invariants from the big, big X. And the homological invariants of knots are just homes between the, uh, the, 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 the a brain describes the caps. The, the same brain in, um, in the upstairs theory can be also used as, as caps, uh, but then you want to braid them. You want to apply this braiding factor. Okay, so to get homological knot invariants, you need to compute this. Uh, equivariant mirror symmetry relates this to the following computation, where now the caps and the cups are no longer the same brains. The, the cap brain is simply the I brain, the brain whose image on the factor going up is the U brain, the, the cup upstairs. But the cap uh, is, uh, is obtained by starting with the downstairs cap and sending up and back down through this, through this factor, whose action we now know. And moreover, the braiding functors commute with everything uh, um, as, as is manifest on the A side. Now, the virtue of this derived equivalence um, is that any brain, any Lagrangian um, downstairs um, has a projective resolution as a complex, all of which terms are direct sums of symbols. Um, that's true for any brain in particular, it's true for these brains that uh, serves as, uh, as caps. In fact, also it's true for the images on the brain, simply because it's true for any brain. Um, what this complex does is literally it describes how to get the, the, uh, the wanted brain, starting with the direct sum of symbols and taking connected sums. It's basically a sequence of cone maps. Um, so the differential, if you just start with the direct sum of symbols, the differential is trivial because the differential acting on symbol is just trivial, okay. Um, but, uh, um, but what the maps do is they deform this differential away from the trivial one. In physics language, it corresponds to turning on expectation values, a bunch of tachyons that connects the brains and takes connected sums. Now, um, it's um, an elementary fact that from such a complex, you get from free a complex of vector spaces uh, of, that describes the homes from this brain to any other brain, in particular from, to the brain that serves as caps, okay? Uh, together with the action of the differential that squares to zero. Now, in general, what this was uh, a simple expression like this does is, is really hides some kind of big double complex because in, for general brain, you'd have to use the resolution uh, of the brain you take the home with, right? And so to compute this, you need some horrible spectral sequences and whatnot, okay? 
Um, in this case, well, sorry, firstly, from this, the, the link homology is simply the cohomology of this complex. Okay. Now, the wonderful fact is that this is not secretly some kind of double complex. Each term in, in, in this complex is not a complex itself. It's simply a vector space. Um, it's a vector space, which is explicitly known. Uh, so what's the vector space? Well, it's simply C to the power, what power? It's the power, it's the number of times the, 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 the thimble correspond, the, the thimble, the, the left thimble dual to the cap um, appears in, uh, in, in the resolution of, in, in, in this guy, okay? Uh, and uh, you, the home is just C to the end because the brain's a dual, right? So taking the home basically kills everything uh, in this uh, B E sub K brain, everything other than the terms that come from T sub U and then counts how many they are. That's the only thing that survives. Now, from the perspective of the theory on why, we've, done, we've just done something remarkable. Per definition, uh, the homology group is the cohomology of the floor complex spanned by intersection points of the two Lagrangians and graded by the Fermi number uh, or mass of degree uh, and equivariant degrees. And to compute the action of the differential on the, uh, on, on, on the intersection points, you have to count instantons. They go from one intersection point to the, another, disk instantons, right? Uh, now, the cylindrical approach to floor theory simplifies this. It simplifies this to um, reduces the counting of holomorphic maps to problems in complex analysis, um, like Riemannian mapping theorem. But this problem, uh, it turns out is solvable as what we are discovering. Um, so what we're getting is the second description of this floor complex without any further work from the description of, uh, of the cap, of the braided cap brain um, as a complex of symbols, how you build it from symbols. In fact, the vector space that you get as the K term in the complex is simply spanned by the intersection points of the equivariant degree J and Fermi number K. And the maps in the complex. So it follows that the complex itself is isomorphic to the floor complex with the differential that's constructed classically that describes how you build that brain uh, sums up the action of instantons. Now, Recall our running example um, of y, which is the equivalent mirror of the uh, a minus one surface. So mirror to the i's vanishing p1 in small x, which, is a, um, which acts as a simple of the algebra a, is a simply this, look, the right symbol of Lagrangian that runs between the corresponding endpoints. And uh, the function that it goes up simply pairs it uh, with a circle fiber over it. So we get a, uh, this way, we get a, a vanishing P1 upstairs. Now the factor, it, the vanishing S2, a Lagrangian sphere in the big Y, the factor that goes down. And of course it doesn't matter whether you compute that factor that goes up and down, either going diagonally or simply going up and down. You get, the, you, you get, the, you get an equivalent brain. Here I'm describing in terms of just going up and down from the small Y to the big Y. So the factor that goes up, and then down, doesn't send the interval brain back to itself. What it does, either computing it from complexes and resolution or, or computing it by uh, um, these um, Lagrangian correspondences, it sends the interval brain to a figure eight. The right basic feature of these adjoint functors that they preserve the homes is manifest here. Uh, the homes upstairs and the big Y uh, are simply intersections. Like well, in this case, then, there are no instantons. So they simply count the intersection points, right? Um, and so it's manifest, for example, well, um, to compute the self-intersection of a sphere upstairs, you need to deform it, right? Um, so you'll actually find that a home's from a sphere to itself, its home space is two-dimensional. And here you find a two-dimensional space of homes between the figure eight and the interval, okay? Or for example, these two brains, they intersect at a single point and corresponding with the figure eight intersects at an interval at a single point. Now, in fact, the, this running example um, is um, relevant. Well, it comes from taking G is SU2 uh, and taking um, uh, a single uh, smooth um, SU, uh, SO3 monopole with M singular ones. We would get covenant homology 
we, uh, if we, instead of taking single smooth monopole, we take D of them, okay, uh, with still M singular ones. So uh, that gives you a um, covenant homology for any link that's obtained by closing a braid with two D strands. And any link can be obtained by closing a braid with two D strands for some D. Um, now, its equivariant mirror is uh, obtained by um, starting is Y, which is obtained by starting with um, symmetric product of uh, D points on the Riemann surface, deleting a locus where any pair of points coincide either with themselves or with one of the punctures, and, uh, uh, and uh, turning on the potential. And there's some resolution that happens when a pair of points coincide with the puncture. Uh, coincide with each other and with the puncture, <laughs> right? Um, so uh, now in the big X, the cap and the cup brains are um, simply brains uh, wrapped on a collection of D non-intersecting P1s. They are structure sheaves of product of D non-intersecting P1s. Uh, this cup or cup brain upstairs comes um, via this functor that goes diagonally up uh, from the brain, which is simply a product of D non-intersecting intervals. So here D is equal to two. And um, this brain is actually a single brain downstairs, even though it's two intervals, right? Because we're working in a symmetric product. So um, <clears throat> this, um, uh, the image of the brain upstairs that you get upstairs, the, this collection of P1s, sending it back down is a product of D non-intersecting figure eights. So you get a picture like this. Uh, the homological link, invari link invariant is a space of morphisms then, uh, or the space of supersymmetric ground states between uh, the product of these simple intervals and the braided product of figure eights. Okay. So um, in the lambda gisberg description, in fact, both the Lagrangians and the action of braiding has become geometric. So um, we can simply start with a pro projection of a link to, a surf to, to our Riemann surface A, translated into pairs of Lagrangians by choosing a bicoloring with equal number of strands of each color, such that um, the red always underpasses the blue and, uh, and, uh, and uh, turning on uh, the blue strands into intervals and the red strands into figure eights or the other way around. Um, and so this is how we get this picture. The spaces of morphisms are a priori defined as the cohomology of the floor complex, graded by cohomological and equivariant degrees, and with differential that's obtained by counting instantons. However, uh, while a priori in floor theory, to, co to compute a homology, you need to count instantons, to compute the Euler characteristic, all you need to do is to count uh, the intersection points of the Lagrangians keeping track of grading. Usually, we just count intersection points of Lagrangians just keeping track of signs, uh, the Fermi number, but here we also have equivariant grades to keep track of. And uh, while uh, this theory has really two equivariant grades, uh, in other words, um, one associated with Q and the other one associated with the holonomer on S1, because it can also take care of um, uh, it can also describe links in R2 times S1. Here, we're keeping the, the knot in just a single patch of the Riemann surface. So the second grading, the one associated with hol holonomies um, around the circle, don't come in. So the theory becomes single graded. Anyway, but to compute the other characteristic, all you need to do is count intersection points between Lagrangians, um, keeping track of grading. Now, the fact that there's this funny way of computing uh, the Jones polynomial has actually been observed. Uh, it's a theorem of, of Bigelow from the 90s. Uh, uh, um, he, Bigelow followed the work of, 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 of Lawrence and uh, was, who actually started by studying conformal blocks and thinking how you would get knot invariants by essentially running the classical version of the story, not the homological one. Okay. And what he came up with is a construction uh, uh, with that that requires you to do to to take intersections of figure eights and intervals, but he didn't know why this would this, this made sense. Now we understand from that it's a consequence of equivariant mirror symmetry. The fact that you are 
trying to describe the theory that really wants to live upstairs, which will become more symmetric from the downstairs perspective. But the downstairs perspective is much more economical. We saw the algebras that, that describe the downstairs theory are much smaller. So for an example, for example, if you wanted to compute the homology for trefoil, you'd have the following brain configuration. Now for simplicity, let's ask about reduced covenant homology, where um, in reduced covenant homology, um, well, it, it actually, it's oil characteristic is uh, the Jones polynomial, the way um, some, it's sometimes defined, which, which where you said the, expect, the uh, expectation value of the unknown to one. So correspondingly, the unknown homology is trivial, okay? So um, to compute the reduced covenant homology, you get to cut, you, you get to reduce uh, uh, the number of Lagrangians required by um, um, so removing one, one blue and one red Lagrangian. So this, um, and this way we reduce the problem to just the theory of, with the equal to one, one single smooth monopole. So we are back in our running example. So, this braided figure eight brain uh, has a, a resolution in terms of symbols, which you get by simply stretching. Uh, so before we, I, I drew this, the, these left symbols horizontally. Now I wrote the picture, so they run vertically. So, uh, uh, of course, it, <laughs> it doesn't really matter how you do it. You'd get you. Um, well, once you put it on a cylinder, it does matter, okay? I mean, our plane picture doesn't anymore, but okay, anyhow. Um, so uh, it's, yeah, you, simply, you simply stretch the knot, knot out uh, and where they break, where we're thinking of uh, the, the ends of the thimbles as at infinity and uh, where the thimbles join are elements of the algebra. So you can, which algebra? It's just the, the paths on our on our on our affine a n quiver because we are back in a d equal to one setting. Okay, uh, so you can directly read off from the brain its resolution uh, in terms of the symbols involved and the algebra elements and the differential closes um, to get the following complex. Now, out of this complex, so to uh, to get uh, the homological link invariance, we have to compute the homes between this brain and the, and the cup brain, which is now this I sub two brain. The only intersection it has, the, 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 the second I brain has only intersection with the second, second T thimble and no others. Here we have several second T thimbles because it, uh, the, the T2 thimble appears several times. So out of the big complex that describes the brain, you pick a tiny piece that tiny piece is the reduced covenant homology of the trefoil. Okay. All right, so uh, now um, let me describe the string theory origin of the story in the, in the remaining time. Um, so two dimensional theories we've been uh, talking about have originated directly from string theory. Now, in a sense, string theory origin of our construction was stumbled upon by mathematicians many years ago in a related but somewhat different context that would be been asking so far, and they also didn't know it. <laughs> so uh, the KZ equation associated with a finely algebra has a generalization, which is even more striking from some perspective. The, the generalization or deformation corresponds to replacing the finely algebra by what's called the quantum affine algebra, which is its H bar deformation. The quantum affine algebra is related to the affine Lie algebra by the same construction uh, that um, it relates uh, the quantum group to the finite Lie algebra. The uh, quantum uh, corresponding to this generalization is a quantum KZ equation, which is a regular difference equation uh, and reduces uh, to the KZ, and it reduces to the KZ equation in the limit, which I'll call the conformal limit. Now, the right-hand side of this, of the KZ equation, as we saw in the first talk, involves classical R matrices, but while the right-hand side of this quantum KZ equation involves an R matrix, which intertwines evaluation representations of the quantum affine algebra. Okay, and the step P of the difference equation so we're deforming the theory by one parameter, h-bar. 
So the step P of the difference equation is related to kappa and H bar by the following relation. So we'll, um, we'll need this later. So we recover the KZ equation from this QKZ equation in the limit where the deformation parameter goes to one, uh, where the level of the finally algebra kept fixed. The limit is a conformal limit in the sense that while the affinely algebra uh, contains uh, Virasoro as a subalgebra, the quantum affine algebra uh, does not. Now, the fact that uh, uh, the deformation breaks conformal symmetry is manifest uh, manifests itself in the in the sense that uh, working on a cylinder and on, and on the plane is no longer equivalent. Now, the, this equation was. The deformation, simply as a deformation of the of the KZ equation, was discovered by Igor uh, Frankel and Rishitikin in the eighties. Now, what they showed is remarkable. They showed that not only you can deform the equation, which is maybe not that surprising, because in fact that was their starting point. Um, there was a natural deformation of the right hand side of the KZ equation, so they wrote down this QKZ equation. The fact that they discovered, and what is striking, is the fact that all of the story of performal field theory deforms. So just like in conformal case, the solutions of the QKZ, uh, of the KZ equation uh, can be obtained as correlators of chiral vertex operators. The same is true in this deformed case. So you can get solutions of the QKZ equation by, defor by, by uh, an analogous construction, except that everything is Q-deformed. In particular, like in the conformal case, chiral vertex operators there are chiral vertex operators which act as intertwiners of Ramon module representations. Um, and from, by sewing, you get um, the correlators which we'll call Q conformal blocks of the affine algebra, quantum affine algebra. Now, the reason the story is remarkable is that a priori it had no right to happen, it has no right to exist. There's no natural way of breaking conformal invariance to deform the case equation to some other equation, be it a difference equation. Uh, there, is, there are many different ways you could go about it and there's absolutely no reason to expect anything good to come of it. Why should you be able to preserve, to break conformal invariance while preserving all the structure inside? Now, mathematicians have worried about this. Um, and uh, there's a beautiful book by, um, uh, Ettingov, Igor Frankel, and, and Kirillov um, uh, on the KZ equation and um, its uh, Q deformation and the associated representation theory. So in the preface to this book, they admit to falling prey to addictive charm of the Q disease. And they defend themselves by saying that everybody will eventually realize that the Q case is in fact much more interesting than the original. Why should that be true? Um, now, the reason that this is true is that the structure originates from a remarkable string theory in six dimensions, labeled by a choice of a simple list Lie algebra. This um, six dimensional uh, theory, string theory, has supersymmetry of what's called a zero two type. And other than having to pick a simple list Lie algebra, it's completely unique. Any string theory breaks conformal invariance because a string, being a string, has a scale. It's the characteristic size of a string. Um, now, this six dimensional string theory is special in particular because it has a point particle limit in which it becomes um, zero to a conformal field theory. So it has a conformal point particle limit. So um, now the fact that this uh, a zero to conformal field theory that results labeled by choice of a simple lace Lie algebra should know everything there is to know about quantum link invariants and how they get categorified has been anticipated by physicists in the pioneering works of Aguri and Vafa uh, in the paper that appeared actually in the same year as Kovano's work on categorification. Um, and uh, also the follow-up work by Gukov, Vafa and Schwartz that made a connection between the two, uh, that established the connection between, that there should be the connection between those two works. Now, the difficulty 
in getting physics to bear on the categorification problem is that the six dimensional theory is extremely difficult to understand directly, even for physicists, incomparably so, uh, more so than, for example, Young Mills theory, because um, the theory doesn't have um, a classical limit to use as a starting point. This makes it hard to get an angle on the problem that's precise enough and general enough to give a unified framework for not categorification that comes out of physics, um, as the works of Oguri and Waffa and Book of Schwartz and Waffa told us to expect. Um, now, it turned out very surprisingly that thinking about the six dimensional string theory rather than six dimensional conformal field theory is what opens up the window into the problem. And this is in part the illustration of the observation of the uh, etting of Frankel and Kirillov that the Q case is somehow in some ways more interesting yet. The six dimensional string theory uh, is obtained as a limit of type 2b, um, type 2b string theory on an AD surface singularity of type G. Uh, and for on G is for us AD type. So by taking a limit in uh, which uh, so you get from the 10 dimensional string theory, a six dimensional string theory, by taking a limit that only keeps the degrees of freedom supported at a singularity and the couple the 10 dimensional bulk. So uh, to, to connect this to the world of quantum affine algebras, one, one wants to study the six dimensional two zero little string theory on the six manifold, which is a product of the Riemann surface where the conformal blocks live, uh, the domain curve of the two dimensional theories we had so far and an extra complex plane to make up the dimensions. The vertex operators on the Riemann surface come from a collection of defects in little string theory, which are inherited from D brains of 10 dimensional string. This limit that takes the 10 dimensional string to the six dimensional one kills some many brains, but some survive. Some D brains survive and uh, the D brains we need uh, originate from D3 brains in type 2B string theory, wrapped around two cycles of the AD surface that becomes invisible in, in the six dimensional string, uh, and, and have a life as, as two dimensional D brains of the six dimensional string. So the two dimensional D brains of the six dimensional string uh, supported at points on the Riemann surface, uh, the D and at the origin of this extra complex plane. In fact, we'll have two kinds of D-brains. We'll have D-brains that, that are compact, that are supported on compact two cycles, okay? Those being compact and light will be free to move around. But we'll also have heavy D-brains, which are D3-brains that wrap on, um, on, on non-compact two cycles, uh, dual to the compact ones. The, the remarkable thing about AD surfaces is that they know um, about representation theory. The second uh, homology group of the of the AD of the AD surface is the same as the root lattice of the corresponding Lie algebra, but the second relative homology group turns out to be the same as the weight as, as the weight lattice of the of the corresponding Lie algebra. Okay, so that's why uh, non-compact cycles have something to do with weights. So from the non-compact D brains, non D3 brains wrapping non-compact uh, uh, two cycles in the uh, in the uh, in the in the AD space, we'll get uh, we'll get vertex operators. Okay, so this is why they're heavy D brains um, of of two zero string theory. Now the theory on the D brains is a quiver gauge theory. Uh, the fact that it's a quiver gauge theory uh, where the quiver is of type G, the same type as the as the AD surface and the same type as the little string. Uh, the fact that the theory on D brains. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, was this a question? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay, good. All right. The fact that um, the theory on the D brains is a quiver gauge theory is a consequence of familiar description of D brains and AD singularities due, due to uh, Douglas and Moore in, in 96. Um, and in particular, the, uh, the brain supported in compact cycles uh, give rise to uh, um, uh, gauge nodes of the quiver and the brain uh, supported in non-compact cycles to flavor nodes, to framing nodes, the red ones. 
Now, the theory on the D brains, even though, uh, so the D brains are supported on D, on this two dimensional space in, in six dimensions. The, the theory on them turns out to be not a two dimensional theory, but a three dimensional one. It's a three dimensional quiver gauge theory on D times a circle. Because two zero string theory is a string theory. If you have a D brain, you're going to have winding modes. Any D brain will have winding modes that, uh, and if there many, that any D brain that's at a point on the Riemann surface, which is a cylinder, will have winding modes that begin and end on the brain and run around the circle. Um, you can trade that description in terms of winding modes, in terms of a more natural one, making the fact that, uh, that the theory is actually three dimensional, you can make that fact manifest by T duality, right? Uh, as a string theory has T duality. Um, now, one of the results, so actually our theory is a three-dimensional gauge theory on a circle with this quiver. Now, one of the uh, results of my prior work with Andrea Kunko um, and, um, is that um, one can get fundamental solution of the QKZ equation, solutions that span the space of conformal blocks of the quantum affine algebra, either from the Coulomb branch or from the Higgs branch of this three-dimensional gauge theory compactified on a circle. Uh, the Q-conformal blocks are part supersymmetric partition function of the three-dimensional gauge theory on D times S1, which um, include uh, holonomies for um, the R symmetries of the theory. And, uh, and also where uh, you, uh, in, um, in, you rotate the, uh, the domain D and rotate the extra uh, transfer space of the, the extra transfer complex plane gets rotated as well. Okay. The, the domain D is rotated with parameter P and the extra complex plane with parameter H bar. Um, the, rec the ranks of vector spaces, which quiver gauge theory should you study, determine the representation and the weight in that representation the conformal blocks transform in. Okay. Uh, uh, all the representations that arise are fundamental, and the rank of the m of the eighth framing node is how many times the eighth fundamental representation enters. Uh, the weight nu in that representation is uh, from that from the weight nu in the total representation. You read off the ranks of the quivers, as I think has been explained. Uh, that kind of correspondence has appeared many times in this conference. Um, the positions of vertex operators are positions of the heavy flavor brains, the three brains on the Riemann surface. The highest weight vector of the Verma module um, comes from phi to Leopold's terms in three-dimensional theory. From the perspective of the six-dimensional two-zero theory, it's a complex scalar field in, in six dimension. Turning on the complex scalar field, turning on the parameter lambda, abelianize the six-dimensional two-zero theory. It takes it, um, it breaks, all the, uh, the, the, the non-abelian two-form symmetry that this theory has, okay? Uh, now, the fact that the bulk six-dimensional theory lives in the broken phase is extremely important because it means that all the fancy complicated bulk dynamics is just not important in the problem. Now, which solution of the QKZ equation the partition function computes is determined by the boundary condition at infinity? of this, uh, so you want to think of the domain as this long cigar. It's a complex plane, but it's, which is infinite to begin with, but it's still, in all of this better to think of it as a long cigar. Now, the fact that um, what Andre now showed is that you can get a partition function from either um, the Coulomb branch, X, or X check, the Higgs branch, is a reflection of three-dimensional mirror symmetry, which implies that with suitable identification of parameters and boundary conditions, Coulomb branch and the Higgs branch are interchangeable for the kinds of questions we are asking. Now, for the theory um, uh, defined by this quiver Q, the Coulomb branch is, uh, uh, is X, giving our big X a third interpretation in addition to the moduli space of monopoles and the resolution of the transversal slice in the affine Grassmannian. The Higgs branch is the Nakajima quiver variety. Uh, from the positions of vertex operators, um, uh, from the perspective of the Higgs branch, equivariant parameters, while from while the uh, Kähler parameters, from perspective of the Coulomb branch. Pursuing the story further, rather than 
stay staying in the world of quantum affine algebras and three-dimensional gauge theories um, compactified on a circle, rather than discovering not invariance, we would discover integrable lattice models. Um, in other words, monotony problem of the QK's equation doesn't give rise to not invariance or braid invariance. It gives rise to integrable lattice models. And that's the story that uh, developed in the work of Andre and I. Um, that's not the direction we want to uh, go in today. Um, instead, we want to take the, uh, the point particle limit of the string theory. Um, this point particle limit um, coincides magically uh, with the conformal limit of the quantum affine algebra. This is why quantum affine algebra that Frankel and Rishitikin wrote down was the good thing. That is why. Okay. Um, the, um, it's the, in other words, it's the right deformation. It's a deformation. How do you pick the right magical deformation? It's the magical deformation that doesn't simply break the conformal invariance of the two zero conformal field theory in some stupid way. It breaks it by giving you a string theory. That's what's magical about it. Um, this point particle limit, uh, in this point particle limit, the winding modes that make defects of the three, that make two dimensional defects of six dimensional string three dimensional, in the point particle limit, uh, winding modes are heavy, infinitely heavy. So as a result, in the point particle limit, you recover um, the theory on defects becomes two dimensional, not three. Now, it's surprising, but by now very well understood that there are different two dimensional limits a three dimensional gauge theory can have. The point particle limit of the little string theory specifies exactly which two dimensional limit of the three dimensional gauge theory in a circle you need to take. That's also the limit that takes the, again, world of QK's equation in quantum affine algebra to affine Lie algebra. The limit we need isn't the obvious one that would take a three-dimensional gauge theory to a two-dimensional gauge theory with the same Lagrangian um, or some other limit. Instead, it's the limit that would do this for the 3D mirror theory. Okay. It's the obvious two-dimensional limit of the mirror 3D theory if it were a gauge theory. Specifically, the conformal limit, um, amounts, which amounts to taking h bar to one, takes uh, the, takes, P to one, the parameter with which we are, uh, so it takes both equivariant parameters to one, keeping the, the, the relative rate at which they go to one fixed, that's kappa. And also it takes to one uh, the parameter Z, which is uh, H by, so I call it H by to the mu, it's H by to the lambda. Okay. So what the limit does, okay, I'll now say what this means. Uh, the limit simply uh, undoes the h bar deformation, keeping uh, positions of vertex operators fixed and keeping the weight of your mom modules at the two ends fixed. Okay. That's simply keeping the data of the conformal block fixed. Now, what does this do to the three dimensional theory? It turns out, and uh, um, I'm des describing it a little bit too fast uh, so, so for you to follow in real time, but this is what it does it treats the Coulomb branch and the Higgs branch very differently because it treats uh, uh, the variables that go to one are Kähler variables for X check and uh, equivariant parameters uh, for, for X, for the Coulomb branch, okay? Uh, and the parameters that are fixed are Kähler variables for the Coulomb branch and equivariant parameters for the Higgs branch. Now, from the perspective of the Coulomb branch, the limit is the most obvious, wonderful limit you can take. Uh, um, it's k variables are the positions of vertex operators and they're kept fixed. So it's the most obvious limit in which takes the three-dimensional sigma model on, on X or uh, to a two-dimensional one. From perspective of the Higgs branch, the limit is not geometric at all because the limit turns makes the space extremely singular. It turns off its scalar variables. So what you get instead is a lambda Gisberg model with a target Y and potential W that I described. The potential is a limit of the three-dimensional effective superpotential, which um, you compute by one loop calculation that integrates out all the um, charged matter. 
um, that's made massive by all the equivariant parameters we turned on. Um, and uh, for, for and for this reason, it can be because it's just a one loop calculation. You can simply read off what is the the, the superpotential from the quiver as uh, contributions of its nodes and arrows plus taking the, 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 the right two-dimensional limit. Um, and, um, and so now the way we understand which theory we should study that gives you conformal blocks, it's the, we're, we're back at the beginning of my first talk and it's, uh, or the beginning of the second talk, depending on whether you want to work with Y or the Coulomb branch X. All right, um, now there's a third description of the problem um, due to Witten, uh, and it describes the same physics just from the bulk perspective. Compactified, well, in six dimensions, the two zero theory is mysterious. Compactified on a very small circle, uh, it becomes um, a gauge theory of this associated with the same Lie algebra in one dimension less. To get, to get a, so, um, Witten's description starts by taking with starts with by by starting not with two zero little string theory but with two zero conformal field theory on the six dimensional space the same six dimensional space that I had a while ago and to get a good a five dimensional description of the problem um, uh, one shrinks um, Witten shrinks the circle that um, corresponds to um, it's the circle in this extra transverse complex plane. That played no role so far, very little role so far. Okay, because you are getting, um, you're taking, you're you're reducing the theory in a circle that's contractible. You get a five-dimensional gauge theory on a manifold with a boundary. The boundary is where the circle shrinks. Um, so um, the five-dimensional gauge theory, and um, is supported on D. Uh, remember, this, the, the D is the domain of our two dimensional theories. It's also part of the uh, six dimensional space time times the three manifold. The three manifold is the Riemann surface where conformal blocks live times, our, uh, times a, a positive half plane. Okay. It has gauge group G, which is the eigen form of the Lie group with Lie algebra little g. Um, the two dimensional defects become monopoles, monopoles uh, of the five-dimensional gauge theory. Monopoles in five dimensions are two-dimensional. So they're supported on D and uh, at points um, on M3 along its boundary. Um, the um, direct type monopoles um, uh, uh, come from heavy defects, heavy D3 brains, and, um, and the smooth monopoles from the light ones. Um, this is one way to understand the connection of, um, of our theory to monopoles. And in fact, um, deriving the string theory derivation um, of why the Coulomb branch is a monopole moduli space can also easily be ex explained in this, in this framework. Anyway, what Witten shows is that um, five-dimensional gauge theory on this, five, uh, on, the, on this five manifold with the boundary can be viewed um, as a lambda gisberg model on, uh, on D with a potential, which is uh, uh, turn Simon's um, uh, functional um, on the infinite dimensional um, um, target space, which is uh, the space of all um, um, complex uh, GC connections on this manifold with a boundary, with suitable boundary conditions that depend on the knots. So you get a lambda gisberg model, analogous to the lambda gisberg model uh, with finite dimensional target Y and a superpotential W, just with an infinite dimensional target space. Uh, so to obtain uh, knot homology groups in this approach, uh, that you'd get the differential by counting solutions to certain five dimensional equations, analogous to, um, the way we get differential in, uh, in our lambda gisberg model by counting instantons, which are solutions to some two-dimensional equation, because five is two plus three. Uh, so in this way, uh, we end up with three different approaches to knot categorification problem, all of which have the same string theory origin. 
they all describe the same physics starting in six dimensions. The two geometric approaches describe physics from perspective of defects that introduce knots in the theory. The approach based on, on, on the five gauge theory describes the story from perspective of the bulk. In general, theories and defects capture only local physics, um, what happens near the defect. In this case, they capture all the relevant physics because uh, you, one has a ver version of supersymmetric localization. If we didn't have these defects, the bulk theory would have been trivial because it's in the broken phase. So everything interesting comes from the defects. So you should be able to understand everything from perspective of the defects, which is what I described. All right, thank you all. This is the end of the lectures. <laughs> Let's take uh, Mina. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, yeah, I guess uh, Aswin. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, hi Mina. So I, I have a couple of questions. So uh, the first question is uh, about the reduction of the 3D n equal to 4 theory on a circle. Yes. Uh, could you say again uh, uh, what you meant uh, when you said like, uh, I think there was like on the mirror side, it's sort of the naive dimensional reduction, mm -hmm. but on the side of the theory that you were considering, uh, there was something non-trivial happening. Right? Okay, uh, let me say it like that. So we're, we're, trying, to the, um, we're trying to reduce a three-dimensional theory in a circle. Right. A three-dimensional theory that, uh, so in the problem now, uh, we have the radius of the circle, we have the mass parameters, we have phi to the plus parameters, all of which are dimension four, okay? And the question is, what do you keep fixed in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, in the limit that's, uh, as you go down? Uh, mm -hmm. the, um, there, is, uh, an, um, there is an obvious limit that will take the three-dimensional gauge theory with a given Lagrangian, to a two-dimensional gauge theory with the same Lagrangian, okay? Uh, in that limit, nothing happens to the masses, but the two-dimensional phi to Leopold's parameters are the three-dimensional phi to Leopold's parameter times R, okay? So you'll keep R times the three-dimensional phi to Leopold's parameter fixed, okay? So in that obvious limit, if you take R times the three-dimensional phi to Leopold's parameter fixed, um, and you take R to zero, um, uh, well, it, it, it scales the uh, um, um, yeah, um, parameters. Anyway, so uh, if you were to, um, uh, so what we'll do instead is, uh, so if you were to do that, what would happen the, in the obvious limit, right? That obvious limit would take the Higgs branch of the three-dimensional gauge. So, you, the, the two-dimensional gauge theory you get would have the same Higgs branch as the three-dimensional gauge theory, but you'd have to think hard what happens in the Coulomb branch. Right. So we'd ask, okay, so what happens in the Coulomb branch? In fact, that's the problem that um, uh, I studied uh, in 2001, together with, uh, um, with Kataro Hori, uh, Andreas Kart, and David Tong. And we asked the question, uh, we wanted to understand what happens to three-dimensional mirror symmetry in the two-dimensional limit. Is there some limit of three-dimensional mirror symmetry that would give you something two-dimensional? So that would give you two-dimensional mirror symmetry back down. Okay. And we asked it from this perspective of sort of the obvious reduction, the reduction which takes the three-dimensional gauge theory on a, on a circle uh, down to a two-dimensional gauge theory on a circle. So from perspective of the of the Higgs branch, the limit is obvious. You just get a, um, um, the, the, the sigma model on the Higgs branch in three dimensions becomes a sigma model on the Higgs branch in two dimensions. In, uh, on, the, on the Coulomb branch side, it's much more mysterious. The, the, uh, and what we showed is that actually with the, the story we did was actually for three dimensional n equals to two. And what we showed is that what happens uh, on the Coulomb branch is that you're naturally, uh, the, um, uh, you're naturally asked to, uh, to, uh, to integrate out carefully kaluza klein modes, all the kaluza klein modes uh, that, uh, um, that uh, the, the theory has. And if you do that carefully, 
three-dimensional mirror symmetry goes down to two-dimensional mirror symmetry, relating the Higgs branch of the n equals to two theory, okay, with a certain landau gisberg model on the other side. Here, we're just doing the reverse, okay? And these kinds of questions have since been studied by people like Aharoni and Cyborg and so forth, right? So there's a subtle but uh, precise sense in which three-dimensional mirror symmetry descends down to two-dimensional mirror symmetry, but it's quite subtle, okay? Okay. Uh, and my other question was basically, uh, uh, it seems like large parts of the formalism would work uh, if you replace this particular 3D n equal to four theory with some other theory, maybe you put a condition saying uh, the Coulomb branches should admit resolutions or something like that. Uh, yeah. Is that true? Yeah, I think or... that's totally, I think that's very interesting. Um, yes, uh, in, in particular, uh, one can do the story for any three-dimensional gauge theory, even those with affine quivers or, um, uh, there, there, there should be a story for that as well, because in some sense, this is completely general. It's just that the kind of uh, uh, quantum algebras that will arise would be different. And in fact, uh, in some sense, this is how the story developed upstairs for big X, right? Um, the algebra, uh, the big A algebra is, um, uh, I mean, the, the way Bez, Bezrukovnikov and, um, and Kaladin get it is a quantization of, of, the, of, of X, but those quantizations now physicists and except for the fact that it's characteristic P, but the, you know, they're, they're, they're certainly studied. Anyway, they certainly make sense for any Coulomb branch whatsoever, right? So there is a story for any Coulomb branch whatsoever that we want, for which one should be able to do an exactly analogous thing, right? You would not get knot invariants in general uh, because getting knot invariants, the question, yeah, it's a very interesting question. Exactly how much of the structure will you preserve? It's, it's a really interesting question. Cool, thank you. Thanks a lot for patiently answering and for the sequence of lectures. Thanks for the great questions. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, Pranav also has a question. Uh, first of all, thanks for the wonderful series of lectures. Um, so uh, I, I think my question might be the same as Ashwin's, but I'm since I'm not a physicist, maybe I, I didn't understand uh, completely. So um, this little string theory that you study in six dimensions, um, now you, you were studying it on some AD singularity. Uh, uh, no, it's a little strength of AD type. Uh, the AD singularities only enter if you, you know, trying to understand how it comes from a 10 dimensional string. Uh -huh. right, but otherwise you can just, it's, it starts as live in six, six dimensions, it's labeled by a Lie algebra and that's it. Right, uh, now if you, if you replace that by some other target space. Ah, uh, uh, no, 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 Th that theory is unique. That I theory see. is completely unique. Uh -huh. uh, it's. It's possible, again, related uh, uh, to Ashwin's question, uh, that uh, uh, general quivers of arbitrary types are not related to anything nice. Mm -hmm. There is one exception to that, which are quivers which you get by affinization. Mm -hmm. uh, if you replace uh, uh, you know, a finite type AD quiver by an affine AD quiver. What's mm -hmm. special there is extremely interesting. Um, it's extremely interesting because what you're doing then is you're studying full type 2b string theory. You're not taking, you're not taking the limit that the couple's about. And it's a certainly sensible thing to do. And the theory is extremely special. So you do expect that in that story, which is obtained just by affinization, you'll get a really fabulous story that's worth working out. Okay. Um, now in principle, it works for any quiver. Now I suspect that probably what's gonna happen is that a thing which works for any quiver is interesting to the extent that it's a small piece of some, you know, affine quiver that, you know, that, yeah. And otherwise not, uh, but yeah. But sometimes physicists get surprised. Occasionally, well, okay. The physics tells you that these are the cases that are definitely gonna be interesting and others, mm -hmm. I, I'm not really sure. <laughs> Even mm -hmm. though, yeah, uh, in principle one can, 
define uh, you know the whole story as certainly Okunko and his and you know and 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 Malik and others have uh, for starting with arbitrary quivers. Right, I see. So when you uh, said unique, uh, Coulomb so branches of essentially arbitrary quivers, you see, yeah. or oh. Higgs branches, in fact, of arbitrary quivers as well. Yeah. yeah. I see. But these are not uh, physically interesting from string theory. I suspect that yeah, that, that some structure will be lost. So, okay. Some niceness will be lost for sure. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I had one more question. Or maybe I can ask it well, since there's no other hands raised. But th this is a very concrete question. So you had these adjoint functors between uh, the equivariant, I mean, the big Y category and the, the small Y category. Yes. Uh, are these spherical functors? <clears throat> Meaning that the unit of the junction uh, has an invertible cocoon. Uh, I don't know. I see. Yeah. I, I don't know. Why yeah. would that be important? Well, because I was just trying to uh, spherical functors arise in many contexts. Um, and basically it tells you that, so if you have like a Landau Ginsburg model and mm -hmm. you look at the, the smooth fiber, Mm -hmm. You have the Foucault category of the smooth fiber, and then you have, you have the Foucault cyto category of the, the whole uh -huh. model. And there's a cup and cap functor that goes between those two. No, I suspect they're not. I, I think that they, these are, uh, th these kind of do more. It's not, a, yeah, <laughs> there's no kind of spherical geometry that arises in the story. I see. Uh, well, it's more torical, right? Because uh, we are, well, we are reducing on the C star to the power fiber. So, yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, great. Uh, are there uh, any more questions? Okay. If not, uh, let's thank uh, Mina again for this uh, fascinating series of, of lectures. Thank you all. Thanks for giving me a chance to talk.